Dr. Monju A. Rawi, clinical assistant professor, College of Medicine, the uh, University of Illinois, USA. And Dr. M. Yashapur Rahman, assistant professor, Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Northwest University. And also with us, the panelists, Dr. Mohammad Zin Dafil, associate professor, MBRU Dubai, and associate investigator, in the Hospital for Sick Children, Toronto, Canada. And Dr. K.M. Fulfill, Dean, head of clinical research, Center for Precision Therapeutics, Genetics and Genomics Medicine uh, Center, Neural Gene Children's Healthcare. So let me tell you a little uh, about the Bangladesh Neuroscience Society. It was established in 2017, a pioneering organization in the country in the field of neuroscience. Professor Hassan Mahmoud Reza, the current dean of the School of Health and Life Science, is the founding president of the society. And Dr. M. Yashapur Raman, also our associate professor, is serving as the vice president of the society. Since the inception of this organization, uh, they are creating awareness among the scientific community and also among the general people in the neuroscience area. At the same time, they are involved with research studies in this area in context of our country. NSU Pharmaceutical Science Department has currently six PhD faculties who have been trained in the neuroscience area from world-renowned labs in the different universities. With their support, NSU established neuroscience laboratories with modern facilities for research in this area. NSU is happy to organize today's webinar in collaboration with Bangladesh Neuroscience Society. We appreciate the initiatives of Dr. M. Yashapur Rahman to arrange this seminar. So let me uh, give a little of my screen to share. Uh, Ashraf, uh, I think there is one PowerPoint is already in sharing. Uh, I cannot share uh, when it is there. So if you stop that one, then I can share my one. Okay, I'll uh, stop mine. Yes, Professor. Thank okay. you. Uh, you'll be just joining with us shortly. So I officially declared the opening of the webinar. The title of this webinar is the International Webinar on Post-COVID-19 Neurological Complications and Management. And uh, before I joined the webinar, I was curiously browsing Google to know about the latest of the COVID-19 situation. What I found is the still this alarming. In our country, I mean, like on 28th of January, uh, the new case was 509. And the seven average was 526, the number of infections. So, uh, and in the world context, uh, I mean, like still we are on the low side, but uh, about 8,000 deaths already we uh, experienced in our country. So now we are, according to the graph, looks like we are probably going to uh, the downhill uh, of the COVID um, uh, situation. Um, so what happening is now many of the um, uh, people are coming to hospitals with wide varieties of post-COVID symptoms. And some of them are typical enough to even kill the patient. And managing those are now a prime concern for the healthcare professionals. So uh, what are the symptoms those uh, uh, could be for post-COVID syndrome? Mostly these we uh, experience, fatigue, difficulty in breathing, joint pain, chest pain, pounding, pounding heartbeat, hypertension, persistent cough, brain fog, including an inability to concentrate and impaired memory, loss of chest and smell, sleep issues. And most importantly, I mean, we found black thickening and black talking tendency, which may result in deep brain thrombosis, pulmonary immunism, brain stroke, or a disease like pulmonary heart failure. So these I just, I mean, like highlighted, the reason is in our country, when the physicians are intervening the uh, situation, this is not much attention. So uh, when I was actually talking with some clinical pharmacists in the US, they said most of the post-COVID patients now are uh, under the treatment of 
uh, anticoagulants when they are recovering from their COVID situation. So this is something very important area that uh, we will uh, we have to think, and I'm sure our panelists and keynote speakers will also be focused. So uh, uh, when I was looking at the Washington Post, Washington Post they gave us a, a kind of very um, uh, alarming uh, news, uh, a mysterious blood clotting complication is killing coronavirus patients. And uh, it is the prime concern now in the West, what exactly is happening? And then we just found a um, journal article very recently came out, a marked factor five activity, elevation is severe COVID-19 is associated with venous thromboembolism. For some reason, uh, clotting factor five is elevated uh, found in the post-COVID patient, and that may cause the blood clotting or blood uh, coagulation issue. So uh, that may cause those problems related with blood clotting. So, blood thickening and treatment. Currently, what we have found that uh, those are hospitalized uh, patients, but uh, they have been treated with low molecular weight heparin uh, because of the shorter half life and uh, ability to administer. Intravenously. Whereas those are non hospitalized patients or survivors, they have been given a regimen of oral anticoagulant to avoid these problems. So, uh, this is the area I would uh, be waiting to hear from our panelists also. So our next keynote speaker and panelists will focus others uh, uh, for, uh, on this post COVID situation. I would like to stop here uh, uh, and would be eagerly waiting to learn from others. And if anyone has any uh, questions, they can ask uh, me at the question and uh, answer session at the end of this webinar. So thank you all for your patient sharing. Uh, I would request moderator to uh, go to the next keynote speaker. And thank you for uh, uh, giving me the time to uh, say a few words here. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Um, Next, I would like to invite Professor Ilso Moon, who is working in Donjuk University in South Korea uh, in the Department of Anatomy, College of Medicine. I welcome you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I will share my file first. Uh, before I start my talk, I will uh, introduce myself first. Uh, firstly, I thank you, uh, the organizing members, for inviting me to this uh, great webinar. And I especially I thank uh, Dr. Ariful for uh, choosing me to talk here. Uh, and Dr. Ariful is uh, my first uh, Bangladeshi student in the lab. And uh, he did a great uh, research and he finished now his uh, uh, postdoc fellowship in, in Seoul National University. And uh, he got a uh, assistant professorship job here. And I uh, thank very much uh, accepting him uh, as a professor. Um, I'm a, a neuroanatomy professor in Donggung University here in, in Korea. I uh, started my uh, uh, neuro, uh, neuroscience uh, research uh, by uh, characterizing post-synaptic uh, structures in the uh, uh, California Institute of Technology in California. And I got a job here in 1994. And uh, these days I'm um, uh, mostly majorly work in the uh, neurodegenerative diseases to find out some ways to clear, to clear the protein aggregates. Okay. Um, so uh, let me start uh, my talk. I will uh, talk about meditation uh, with some uh, a neural mechanism to uh, overcome the COVID mental stress. See, the COVID virus uh, problem is now a pandemic and uh, in, 
even in uh, Korea here uh, in uh, we are uh, not experiencing uh, severe cases, uh, severe uh, pandemic, but uh, uh, especially where I live here, this is, here is uh, uh, much safer than uh, other places, even in Korea. Uh, the statistics shows that uh, there has been uh, three waves starting firstly in the early uh, last week, uh, last uh, year, and the second one. And uh, we are just facing uh, by the third wave. Mm. The uh, total, total confirmed uh, patient was is uh, seven, around 77,000 and uh, around 140,000 uh, deaths we have here. Mm. The government, uh, Korean government, uh, set uh, levels of the uh, severity in uh, of the COVID-19, uh, depending on the uh, occurring cases. Uh, now we are uh, in the uh, second level of the uh, uh, prevention policy. In the uh, second level, uh, the, the majorly the uh, social distancing uh, is uh, limited, uh, allowed, uh, uh, very limited, Italy. For example, on the right here, uh, for the gathering, uh, indoor gathering uh, is allowed uh, less than 50 per, per persons, outdoor uh, up to uh, 100. And for private uh, personal meetings, uh, not allowed above five. So we, we can gather up to four, four persons. And public uh, facilities are closed, the schools and the religious facilities, of course, are all closed. And uh, here I show just one uh, photo, uh, the one uh, teacher, probably the elementary is school teacher is communicating, teaching a student uh, through the internet. Yeah. Mm. So uh, the social uh, distancing, which uh, the government uh, set uh, two meters between uh, persons and also uh, the uh, mask, uh, wearing mask is uh, mandatory. Uh, so everywhere, at, at least we have to uh, have distance of the, at least one meter. And even in uh, the meal, uh, meal time, uh, the, Blocking, blocking shield are, are set. Uh, this is very uh, stressful and not very happy situation. Uh, so we are uh, under very stress, stressful situation due to this uh, COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, to manage this uh, stressful uh, situation, uh, I think uh, meditation is a very good uh, 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 implement. Uh, and this meditation is also uh, readily available, simple, and uh, uh, it doesn't cost nothing. And uh, also good point is that uh, this is a non-pharmacological intervention, uh, non-pharmacological. We don't need uh, any pills. And uh, the uh, main uh, efficacy uh, effect of meditation is uh, that the meditation practice uh, lead us to live, to live just in this uh, current present uh, uh, time and current situation. So uh, in short, uh, we need to live here and now, here and now, 
not in the past, not in the future, just here and now. Uh, living here and now uh, is uh, much happier than uh, uh, thinking of uh, the past and the future. So uh, these photos uh, show that uh, uh, we can do meditation uh, everywhere and, in, and also in a, any position, a pos any po postures, I mean, lying, uh, sitting, uh, leaning, uh, any positions. And, uh, and also for any durations, whenever uh, you have time, you can uh, do a meditation for a short time. Uh, if you have enough time, then you can go for longer. Uh, because of this uh, uh, importance of meditation, uh, the New York uh, New York Mayor uh, Andrew Cuomo implemented uh, uh, the uh, meditation to all New Yorkers free uh, free access uh, through the the company. Uh, meditation company Headspace, and so through the many uh, Headspace uh, company uh, program, the New Yorkers are uh, free to get this uh, access to the meditation program. Uh, uh, generally, uh, of course, there are many kinds of uh, meditation uh, skill, uh, but uh, usually. Uh, it can be categorized into walking, walking uh, meditation and seated meditation. Mm. Uh, usually people do the seated meditation. They uh, pay attention and uh, being aware of uh, their uh, breathing, usually breathing. And uh, uh, they uh, pay attention to the air movement through through the nose, through the nostril, or they pay, pay attention to belly movement, belly up, down, belly up, down, being uh, just uh, aware of uh, my belly uh, uh, coming up and going down. And this is a seated meditation. And for walking meditation, we slowly uh, walk around uh, by uh, uh, during the uh, walk, we uh, feel lifting up um, our foot and forwarding and laying down, lift forward, lay down. And we pay attention to this movement and the feelings, sensation of thus our foot sole. Mm. And when, uh, uh, some uh, thoughts intervene, then we pay attention, we're aware of the uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, and sometimes during the meditation, uh, uh, some uh, uh, certain, certain sound, sound may come up and then and those are uh, uh, called salience com uh, coming suddenly, uh, suddenly occurring sound or light or something. Those salients uh, we pay attention to. And uh, repeating uh, this uh, attention and awareness of uh, uh, our uh, body movement that uh, strengthens our brain muscle, brain muscle to uh, cope with the stressful situations. Mm. Of course, the uh, web, mm, uh, different uh, meditation uh, techniques uh, bring up uh, a different uh, type of uh, the EEG uh, brain waves. But uh, usually, uh, people usually do uh, mindfulness meditation. And this mindfulness meditation uh, uh, set, set your brain to uh, alpha, alpha uh, wavelengths. Alpha uh, uh, brain wave is, uh, uh, comes when you are very restful, when your brain is resting. When you are work, uh, working uh, and pay, uh, 
solving a task. Uh, in those uh, time, a beta or gamma waves occurs in the brain. But uh, when you are resting, the alpha uh, brain wave uh, comes to your uh, brain activity. And this is the, uh, the resting state of your brain. And uh, if you set your brain in the resting uh, alpha uh, brain wave state, then uh, somehow uh, this uh, practice uh, strengthens your uh, uh, neural network, uh, and, and which uh, are working for uh, coping with uh, st uh, stress stressful situation. Uh, anyway, uh, either focused attention uh, uh, meditation or open monitoring meditation mantra or uh, compassion meditation. Uh, the common, common, of course, some different specific uh, brain uh, improvement occurs, but uh, uh, mostly uh, the common places are those marked here. Mm. Uh, generally, generally, uh, on the left, see here, uh, left uh, uh, picture, the uh, self awareness attention and emotion control power uh, is increased. Uh, in contrast, uh, weakens the uh, narrative brain. A narrative means uh, talking to yourself, talking your biography, autobiography to yourself. Uh, this is uh, thinking of your past and present and future not paying attention to the current situation, but paying attention, uh, thinking, bringing up uh, your past and uh, future event. Uh, this uh, bioautography uh, narration, uh, narrative uh, situation is not good. This is not uh, uh, bring, up, bring you uh, happy. Uh, uh, just living uh, now and here, here and now is uh, happier than I uh, think we're uh, going back to your past or future. Mm. So uh, the meditation uh, strengthens the power of your brain to stay here and now by increasing the self-awareness, attention, and controlling uh, emotional uh, emotions. Okay. Uh, let me uh, talk a little bit the uh, mechanism and neural uh, circuits. So uh, if you do uh, meditation, uh, either uh, walking or breathing meditation, your uh, body feeling, uh, the sensation is, uh, sent through a spinal cord to uh, the frontal uh, brain, frontal lobe here. And uh, this incoming, incoming uh, stimuli is uh, captured, uh, recognized by uh, the dorsal attention network. Mm -hmm. The external uh, attention uh, is uh, captured by a dorsal attention network. And uh, you are now uh, feeling, you are feeling uh, my f your foot or belly movement or uh, breathing uh, through your uh, nose. And this is just feeling and sensation. Uh, but uh, uh, meditation, mindfulness is uh, something beyond this. This signaling has to go upper level, upper level of uh, network. Uh, which is front to front parietal network, uh, which, which is in the prefrontal cortex. And this prefrontal cortex uh, recognizes, awares, awares of this incoming uh, input stimuli or pay attention to this incoming uh, stimuli. Now I know, now I pay attention to my foot movement. 
now I aware of breathing. My uh, uh, belly is uh, up or going up, belly goes down. I aware, I pay attention. So uh, the front of front parietal network, this is uh, very, very important. Uh, this is called in another name, uh, cognitive control network. Our attention awareness uh, uh, controlled by this uh, network. This make us to live here and now because this network pay attention to uh, the external stimuli, foot movement or belly movement. Mm. But uh, uh, the uh, autobiography is uh, done here by autography brain, here, autography brain. Uh, specifically, that brain network is default mode network. Uh, which is in the uh, uh, front, very frontal and uh, ventral, ventral medial side here. Mm. And uh, this uh, uh, default mode network uh, brings up our autobiographic uh, information. So we need to uh, weaken to weaken uh, this neural network uh, network. Uh, our brain pay attention to either external attention or to internal thought. This is alternative. You do not pay attention to both. Yeah, you cannot do that. When you pay attention to external uh, stimuli, you do not think of yourself. But when you do think yourself, you do not pay uh, uh, attention to outside stimuli. So. Uh, meditation is trying to continuously trying to pay attention to external stimuli. During that uh, uh, paying uh, attend, attending the, to the external stimuli, you don't use a default mode network. If you don't use a default mode network, the neural connection is weakened. That's how you decrease your uh, uh, default mode network. Uh, you become much, much uh, better, uh, more live, lives here and now, attending to external uh, uh, situation and become happier. Uh, the neural uh, network of the default mode neural network do this. Uh, uh, the uh, right panel uh, here uh, shows each circle represents one thought. And uh, the, the thought continues, uh, the bi autobiographic thought continues. You cannot uh, fix your autobiographic thought uh, at the, the, to one thinking, one thought. It continuously drift, uh, drift uh, uh, five to six uh, uh, transitions per minute. So uh, 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 one day, if you are alive, uh, no, awake, uh, awake 16 hours, more than 6,000 uh, thoughts come up to your uh, mind. This thought is, uh, uh, every, this uh, 6,000 thought is coming from default mode network. And it means that uh, uh, it strengthens, strengthens default mode network uh, naturally if you don't to uh, stop it. Yeah, the only way to stop thinking and uh, activating the default mode network is pay, uh, paying attention to outside stimuli, uh, which we, uh, that uh, uh, we uh, practice by a, a meditation. Uh, so here, uh, not my data, uh, I got from literature shows that uh, uh, different uh, meditation uh, method is shown in a uh, corresponding uh, color. And if you compare the control non-meditators with the meditators, the DMN, DMN uh, neural 
uh, power, network power is uh, meditators uh, have a lower, uh, a smaller uh, DMN power. Uh, so meditation decreases, decreases uh, DMN uh, strength. And uh, this is very complex uh, slide, but uh, uh, just get, uh, uh, let me tell you that uh, uh, the uh, meditation uh, lead you to stay better in the current situation, uh, staying, uh, make you stay better here and now. Uh, it is well known that uh, uh, living in the present moment is much, much happier than living, thinking in the past and in the future. So uh, meditation uh, weakens, weakens uh, the DMN network and uh, strengthens the, uh, uh, the, the networks which uh, function in paying the current situation. And so uh, lead you uh, to stay better in better in uh, here and now. Uh, Okay, I introduced uh, meditation as one uh, non-pharmacological intervention to cope with uh, mental stress. For, uh, uh, for meditation uh, practice, we Koreans, we Koreans uh, often go to temple, to temple and stay there over the weekend, overnight, uh, and do the meditation. And another, uh, uh, Non-pharmacological intervention is care farm. I will introduce shortly up to uh, temple stay. Uh, we stay in a temple overnight or over the weekend. Uh, the temple is located in a very uh, subdued, in the usually in the mountain. You forget about your uh, situation. You forget about your current job. Uh, you, you, uh, you, you forget about your uh, current work, work, office work, and you stay here and do meditation and uh, uh, do conversation with uh, monks and also walk around so the trail around the uh, mountain area. I think this is very good uh, uh, way of uh, overcoming the post-COVID uh, uh, pandemics. And the, the other is uh, care farm. Uh, another word is uh, healing agriculture. Uh, uh, recently, uh, last year, our uh, Ministry of Health and Welfare, together with the Rural uh, Development Administration, uh, set out this uh, uh, program. Uh, you uh, rent you rent a small uh, a farm or just visit a uh, farm and care care uh, the uh, plant or livestock animals uh, with your family uh, and I think this is another a uh, good way uh, relieving your stress every weekend you are expecting going to this uh, uh, rural area. And this is fun. And also this uh, gives the financial support to uh, uh, rural, rural farm, uh, farmers uh, because you pay uh, some money to the farmers. And anyway, uh, the meditation and care farm is uh, uh, a good way to uh, uh, relieve the uh, post-pandemic uh, stress. In uh, Bangladesh, uh, you uh, don't have uh, like this Korean temple and you may uh, choose uh, uh, any place of your culture uh, where you can stay uh, rest uh, and rest in a subdued uh, situation, uh, environment. So uh, uh, 
uh, let's keep uh, happy lives uh, even in this COVID pandemic. Okay, uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you so much, sir, for your um, for sharing your knowledge. Um, yeah. Now uh, I would like to call upon Dr. Monzurul Arani, who is serving as a clinical um, assistant professor at the University of Illinois College of Medicine, uh, United States of America. Thank you, Ms. Tahrin, for the introduction. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ashrafur Rahman for inviting me in this webinar. Uh, let me share my screen just a second. Okay. So I believe uh, you can see my screen here. And I think uh, Dr. Moon just uh, mentioned that uh, the situation, current situation in Korea, so how people are living their life here in USA, I can tell that uh, situation is almost similar. And I think I have been working from home from last maybe March or something. Yeah, it has been so long. I sometimes forget which day it is. So because every day looks same to me. <laughs> so. Anyway, and also here uh, we are, um, the situation is uh, currently a little bit improving and, but still uh, people are very cautious. We are still maintaining social distancing. We are always using masks whenever we have a gathering, maybe any religious uh, gathering or something. So we are also maintaining all these social distancing principles. And also the restaurants, those are also like running on a very a strict rules. Uh, we are not allowing many people to sit together. So the one of the good thing is uh, we got two new vaccines available now. So uh, currently a lot of people are getting vaccinated. So I think I, uh, I got my first shot, uh, I think just yeah, last, this month. Yeah, I got it this month. Uh, so hopefully, yeah, next month I will get the another shot. So so things are improving. They started to improve. Uh, so this vaccination process has just started. So we are hoping so that we will be able to start with our normal life, uh, hopefully very soon. And other than that, uh, I can tell that U.S. is probably one uh, the most hit by this COVID pandemic, and so far, I just uh, just just as Dr. Saidur Rahman showed us today, I also checked Google. So, <laughs> what's the current status here? So, I just found that uh, more than four hundred thousand people died in U.S. So, for this related COVID-related complication, and we had about more than 25 million cases, uh, which was confirmed, which is due to COVID. So it's a, which is really big, about 7% of the US population have been already infected with COVID. And, uh, but looking at the numbers from Bangladesh, it's very, it looks good. So Bangladesh is not so badly affected by COVID. And, since uh, today we will be talking more about uh, post-COVID neurological complication, I looked at uh, some recent publications and in those, I will be just focusing on two publications which have used uh, as a large number of uh, population. So th those we can uh, rely, those, all these studies have been done uh, in the US. So. So I'll just go ahead and show you. And also, I will also start from the place where Dr. Saidu Rahman left, like what are the complications related to COVID? So one thing uh, I, uh, most of the people uh, may not realize that COVID has acute effect and also chronic effect. So 
it's not uh, like that COVID is a respiratory illness, everyone knows, so, but COVID can also affect many different organ system. So it will leave its mark in different parts of the body. So it can affect the heart, it can affect the blood vessels, it can affect so many areas, so many organs are affected. So the brains are also not spared, okay? So if we look at the only the neurological complications, we are recently getting some data that, okay, so what, how the brain is involved here. So the virus is not directly probably affecting the brain. So usually our blood brain barrier protects against viruses, right? So, but the virus can still uh, cause some type of hypoxia. So the oxygen supply to the brain can decrease. And also the virus can also stimulate inflammation. So a lot of, uh, it, I think Dr. Ashraf Rahman will also talk about it. So there are some cytokine storm, inflammatory mediators, how they can influence uh, or impact the brain to, and cause a lot of uh, neurological symptoms, right? So I will not go into the mechanism here, but I'm just mentioning to, uh, what could be the reasons uh, this COVID virus, which is supposed to be a respiratory illness, right? So how it's actually affecting the brain, right? And so the COVID complications, what we see in acute phase, mostly the most common uh, symptom is muscle pain, right? Myalgia, headache, and encephalopathy. Encephalopathy is a little bit, it's not a one disease, it's like a complex uh, collection of different diseases. So in encephalopathy, the person may have some confusion, some type of brain fog, altered mental status, uh, and also, so that's why all these things can be collectively called as encephalopathy or brain disease. And the persons may also show dizziness. In the early COVID symptoms, usually a loss of taste and loss of smell have been reported. And rarely, uh, but uh, some report of seizure, stroke, movement disorder, and Guanberry syndrome have been reported, but it's just only few cases. So it's not so, uh, we have to worry so much about it. And the post COVID complications of which is like chronic. So when the fever is gone, the patient is probably released from the hospital or maybe the patient has recovered within one or two weeks. Still after that, some of these acute complication may persist like myalgia, like headache, encephalopathy, dizziness. In addition to that, so we can have chronic fatigue, okay? So the persons may feel very tired for a long period of time. And also some type of dementia, okay? So they can have some type of memory loss, confusion. And also in addition to that, we have been talking so far about neurological complication, but psychiatric complication can also happen. So there have been some study, I will show you the data. So some psychiatric complications like anxiety, some mood disorders, those have also been found. So let's show you. So this is the study which have been done in Chicago, Illinois. And they have looked at about 500 patients who have been hospital admitted. Okay, so those admitted patients when they looked at, so they found these are the symptoms, neurological symptoms. The most uh, common one was myalgia. They reported muscle pain. So if you are wondering why muscle pain, I'm calling it a neurological disorder. So it's like, uh, since any type of pain is related to sensation, right? And sensations are related to sensory nerves. And so all these things are connected to neurological complication also. So myalgia, headache, so you can see, like loss of smell and loss of taste is less people have complained about it. Most of the people have been talking about headache, myalgia, and some of them have been also diagnosed with encephalopathy. And so uh, another thing uh, I just want to mention that here, the patient who have been uh, admitted in the hospital, only those data you are seeing here. It's not like from all the patients who had COVID. So, and it's like only most of the time who have been severely ill, those patients are usually hospitalized. 
And many people, if they have mild symptom, they have only fever, they don't go to the hospital and they admit there. So they try to take care of them in the home. So in those cases, those data you are not seeing here. Okay, I think, and now here, I just wanted to show you the patient demography for this study. So like, you can see that there is a diverse population, the race, races like white, black, Asian. So maybe some uh, Latin American is also there. So it's like a diverse population. So the data we are seeing is coming from a diverse population. So the data probably, I think Dr. Ashraf Rahman will present to you uh, he has some data uh, from Bangladeshi population. So that population is like a homogeneous, right? And this data is like from heterogeneous population. So you have to consider while looking at this data, you have to also consider these things. And another thing I wanted to mention that all the patients that they have studied here, like about 500 patients. So they also had some type of other diseases. There are some other underlying conditions uh, in these patients, right? And also, I think uh, I have not uh, shown the data here, but the average age of these patients were above 50, okay? And like they had chronic kidney disease and most of them had hypertension. You see that about 50% of them were obese, right? And also about 30% had diabetes. So these conditions are actually well known as these people are at risk of COVID complication in general. So CDC has actually mentioned five conditions like chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, COPD, and this chronic kidney disease, and any heart disease, not hypertension, heart disease like heart failure or coronary artery disease, and also diabetes. So all these five things, CDC considered that if you have these five, any of these five conditions, you are at higher risk for COVID infection because in some of these cases, the immune system is weak, right? So you can get more infection from, uh, there is more chance of getting COVID infection in, in this type of uh, underlying comorbidity. Okay, so now let's move on to the next one. So this is the another data, another study. This study is even bigger study. So in this study, uh, it has been published in Lancet Psychiatry where they have looked at about 70 million patient cases. Out of that, they found that 62,000 of the patients had COVID. So then they focused on these 62 patients. The good thing about this study is uh, these patients are actually not from only from hospital admitted. Some of these patients are also from outpatient, right? They went to a primary care provider, they tracked these patients. Oh, one thing I actually forgot to mention in the earlier data that those patients uh, I have just shown you uh, earlier, they have been also followed up for three months. So even after COVID, they followed the patients for three months and after, uh, they found that this is still some of these con uh, neurological complications are still there. And this study uh, from Lancet they also followed up the patients for 90 days or three months, okay? So they are comparable in that sense, but in this study, they have looked at neurological and mostly psychiatric complications, okay? And their, their patient number is also bigger, like 62,000 patients, US population. And here they found that if someone had COVID, they have like more possibility of having anxiety about 20% and mood disorder. A mood disorder could be depression or some other type of mood disorder, bipolar disorder is not mentioned there. But so you can see some dementia is also mentioned. Insomnia is also mentioned. So they have found, but they, uh, those are less, more of them were mood disorder and anxiety. And another interesting thing they showed here that, so if someone had COVID and Based, uh, if you compare with a control population, you will see that the possibility of getting uh, this type of psychiatric illness is about 6% if those patients had other type of respiratory tract infection, maybe COPD or maybe flu. So compared to that, it's almost double. If you see it's around 3% 
it will be about 6% if someone had COVID. So you can see that the chance of having a psychiatric illness is almost doubled if someone had COVID. So in post COVID population, so this is a very interesting thing. Uh, we, this is study revealed. And I also, since I have mentioned the patient demography for the earlier study, so I am also mentioning here that in this big study, uh, 62,000 uh, patients, uh, among them, you can also see heterogeneity, like white, black, Asian, so many people are there, different kinds of people are there, and comorbidity is also present. But it's uh, comparatively less, like you can see about 35% had hypertension, obese patients were here about 20%. It is lesser than the earlier study. And this study has more population, like uh, the N number is higher, so probably and also some of the patients were outpatient. So they are mostly healthy patients, right? So that's why you can see a difference here. And so and this is my last slide. Uh, I just want to uh, make sure that uh, what's the take home message here. So you know that. So from these studies, they have found that there are some risk factors for having post COVID neurological disorder. So if some the patients who had the severe COVID cases, if someone have very severe type of illness, then they have more chance of getting a neurological disorder, okay? And so in case of mild COVID cases, you may not see a neurological disorder, but someone have a severe case, they will definitely see something. And if that person had a history of any other neurological disorder, so then this person had more risk of developing a neurological disorder post COVID. And also if that person had a chronic kidney disease, if that person's age is higher, 65 plus, and if the patient is mostly male, so male patients were mostly affected uh, compared to female. It's not uh, known really why, but these are the things we have found so far. And as you know, COVID situation is evolving and we are learning new things every day. So this is a continuous learning process. But so far, this is the thing uh, we have learned that if you had COVID, the chance of having a neurological disorder is increased. So I think with that, I will stop here and thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your precious time. <clears throat> um, next. I would like to call Dr. Mohammad uh, Uddin Dafil, who is an associate professor uh, in BRU Dubai and also an associate uh, uh, investigator at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. Hi, uh, thank you. Can you see my slides? Uh, yes, we can. Oh, thank you. Okay, all right, great. Um, oh, thank you for inviting me. I would like to thank. Um, Dr. Ashrapur and also the Dean and the Chair um, for organizing this um, conference and also Dr. Moon uh, to join us from all the way from South Korea and also from uh, Illinois uh, University, uh, Dr. Munjuru. So I'll take this thing into, um, into molecular uh, universe uh, and I'll not uh, take much time. Um, so what I'll try to do is uh, I'll try to highlight the importance of um, human genetics or in this regard, uh, host genomics. Um, so if you look at this uh, uh, virus uh, where the linear uh, representation shows different genes within the virus genome. Um, by the way, you can hear me, right? Hello? Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you very loud and clear. Awesome. Uh, so, uh, this uh, genes actually in numbers, if you look at it, it's not much, it's about uh, 10, 10 genes that are structured within the uh, virus. So this is the viral uh, three-dimensional shape uh, in a cartoon image that shows the spike protein here. And this is the human cell, okay? The human cell have these receptors. So the virus spike protein kind of binds with the ACE2 receptor. And through the ACE2 receptor, the virus swoops into the, you know, uh, 
cell. Uh, so the cell membrane kind of, you know, uh, is a blocker, but the ACE2 uh, receptor kind of helps the virus to get inside into the cell. And this is another um, receptor called Tempress. Um, that both Tempress and ACE2 are from human, you know, these, these are encoded from human gene. And these tempers actually prep the spike protein to bind into the ACE2. So the new variants of, uh, of the you know, um, virus actually have a better shape of the spike protein and it locks better. That's why it transmits more um, in uh, South, South Africa and also in uh, UK and now also found in uh, many other countries. But what happens is when the virus enter into the cell, um, you find that there are so many other protein uh, that the viral uh, protein communicates with, right? So these proteins belongs to different signaling and other pathways uh, like insulin sig signaling, RNA processing. Uh, these are major, major pathways. And you can imagine uh, there are only 10 genes and few proteins there from the virus, but uh, we have more than 20,000 genes that encodes and then it has the potential to uh, interact. And the host genomics is as important as the virus itself uh, because how this interacts will determine the course of the disease, uh, COVID-19, okay? So this is why there are multiple um, large initiatives. One of those initiatives is the COVID human genome effort. So that was initiated by uh, Dr. Casanova and Helen Sue. Uh, Helen Sue is from NIH, Casanova is from Rockefeller. Um, and the multiple you know, institution across the globe, this is one of the largest uh, you know, um, scientific collaboration for host, host genomics. And to, to our, uh, from our country, uh, Neurogen Children's Hospital also participated uh, representing Bangladesh. And Dr. Furkanuddin is the PI uh, who is with us today um, of that project. So this uh, particular group actually um, led by uh, Professor Kasanova and uh, others um, actually combined um, genomic data from severe COVID patients, okay? And the criteria is that uh, if you have a gene that is already been mutated uh, and already been, you know, that gene is part of the immune response. So when the virus enters and our body generates immune response, you will have a faulty immune response. And the faulty immune response becomes the more, you know, the major killer than the virus itself. So these, these are called uh, inborn uh, error of immunity. So the hypothesis is this monogenic cause, uh, susceptibility and resistance of SARS-CoV-2 infection, right? There, there is a monogenic cause. Monogenic meaning there is a single gene mutated, mutation uh, in, in those patients. So if you look at this, all these circles are all of all, all the people who are uh, infected by the virus, there's a large portion who, who are asymptomatic. Some, this green dot represents this, this person is actually resistant to the virus. And then there are symptomatic uh, patients, uh, mild or severe. So these green, uh, light green uh, circles are the you know, uh, severe cases who are elderly, who have so many co comorbid conditions, maybe nothing to, not much to do with the gen genetics itself because they are fragile anyways. But uh, this particular guy who is very young, less than 50 years old, uh, have no co comorbid condition, but he is a severe case or may have died because of COVID. So that's where, what we are, um, you know, trying to find out these cases. Um, actually, now that we know, because the study published the first, first of its paper in science, um, two papers, they showed, um, they showed that, this, that there are at least 10% of these people who have these faulty genes in their genome. And these genes actually, if you look at, uh, they, they are in uh, plasmacytoid dendritic cells and that communicates with respiratory epithelial cells. And th there is a circuit of interference. And this circuit of interference actually involves many uh, protein from different genes that communicates uh, and mostly with type one interference uh, are, are in the middle uh, that stimulates uh, different immune response. And 
these red ones are the core genes that have been identified with influenza virus, uh, which is very close to uh, what COVID does. And the green ones, uh, sorry, the blue ones have been, uh, already been implicated in others. So, you know, this is a very, you know, low hanging fruit. Just look at these genes and see if we find anything and, uh, you know, any mutation in severe patients. So this is what their findings are. So these are, you know, same gene coming up in different individuals. They are not related from different countries even. Um, the inheritance is autosomal dominant, meaning this mutation uh, um, inherited from within multiple generation. And the genetic form is known, the pathway, this is the mutation. Um, and these are the genders and the age. You can see most of the age group are not too old, they're 40s, 50s. Uh, these are the ancestry or country they're from. Um, they survived, but all of them are severe patients. They, 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 uh, they have been uh, diagnosed with PPCR, but they, they were hospitalized. They were in, some of them are in ICU, but um, most of them survived, but uh, there are two diseases from this initial paper. Uh, and this is, these are the genes that within the circuit, um, interference circuit that have found to be uh, mutated. And this mutation you don't see in other, you know, normal population. So what I'm trying to say here is uh, there's a huge uh, susceptibility from the human genetic makeup that we have. Uh, so if we incur any mutation, for example, in TLR3 uh, gene, then we are highly likely to produce a, a faulty immune response. And that faulty immune response will be the killer, not uh, more, you know, more aggressive than the virus itself. It's kind of like a autoimmune disease, uh, uh, you know, kind of scenario. Um, so there are other initiatives. So um, I, I'm part of another initiative where that, that was actually the largest. So that some of our uh, genetic colleagues um, formed another group uh, just to look at the common variants and that we are about to publish in Nature ne next month. Um, so that they also identified 15 new genetic, uh, you know, association with 15 uh, different uh, region in the, in the genome. And now we know about, uh, if you combine all these, we know at least two do dozens of genes are highly associated or causal uh, for se severe life-threatening COVID-19. So um, these patients will require actually different, especially the monogenic disease, they, they, they will require a different uh, customized medication because the vaccine will not help them because they will have a faulty immune response. So uh, th that's not in the media, but th this is, these people are real, they're, they're at least uh, two to two percent, two to three percent that uh, have the mutation within that circuit, interference circuit. But then there are others uh, that, that combine in in, com in combination. It's about ten percent people who have this, you know, uh, deleterious mutation. And population specific genetic variants needs to be looked at because some population might have its own variant that contributes to severe COVID. So Neurogen is part of this consortium who can look at, you know, the Bangladeshi genetics, uh, genetic makeup and identify those pathogenic variants. But unfortunately, um, there is no funding we can look for um, to move forward with this, you know, um, research. So we are looking for, uh, looking to investigate uh, re retrospectively the gen gen genomic data uh, Neurogen children have uh, within their lab. Now I want to try, you know, try to make a link between neurological and neuropsychiatric disease and uh, the human uh, host genomics of severe COVID patients. Uh, so this is one of the paper, I think the previous speaker uh, showed us uh, the you know, phenotypic manifestation and in detail very beautifully. So the, I just want to highlight this one um, table from paper that came out in uh, two days ago in JAMA Psychiatry. This shows the association of psychiatric disorder uh, with mortality among patients with, uh, you know, COVID-19, and it shows a clear um, association with schizophrenia, and it, it's even valid over, uh, after fully uh, adjusted, uh, you know, uh, p-values and odds ratios. Very. Uh, depressing to see this, but the association is very real. Uh, so schizophrenic uh, people have a higher uh, mortality rate uh, than other neuropsychiatric diseases. So as our previous 
speaker, Dr. Monjur said that uh, the virus might not have a, you know, a direct effect in the brain. Uh, but if somebody ha have a predisposition to uh, the brain function, uh, the genetic makeup is such, uh, then anything that they, the environment give them, they will feel uh, discomfort and that, that lead to, uh, you know, a, a not a good scenario for his uh, lifestyle. So the lockdown and all this uh, also have a huge impact in people's mind. Uh, but uh, this virus somehow, uh, even though there is no direct, you know, link, but this schizophrenia, uh, schizophrenic patients are highly likely uh, to be, to, you know, die than, uh, than others. Um, and I, I would say this, one of the reasons might be genetics, um, because we know there is a lot of schizophrenic uh, gene out there. The genetic, you know, genetics is one of the main uh, causal um, reason why schizophrenia manifests in someone. Um, so the relation, establishing the relationship with schizophrenia gene with severe COVID case will be uh, something that you, uh, you know, we should do. Um, uh, not just schizophrenia. There are other neurological di diseases. For example, how about uh, the you know kids with determination, um, epilepsy, or autism, or intellectual disabilities, those, how, how they are um, coping with the, all, all this, not just the psychiatric part of it, how, how about the molecular uh, correlation. So that's uh, what I, uh, that's where I'll stop. And I think that's where uh, we should look at the, the molecular pathogenesis because that will again lead to a customized uh, therapeutics for, for these patients who are very vulnerable. Um, Thank you again for inviting me, and this is a really nice uh, channel to you know convey this message to our Bangladeshi community, scientific community. Um, thank you. I would love to have some discussion later, maybe. Thank you so much, sir. Um, now I would like to call upon Dr. Muhammad Ashifur Rahman, sir who is an assistant professor at the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences in uh, Nasser University. And he's also the vice president of Bangladesh Neuroscience Society. Okay. Okay. Is everything fine? Tarin? Can you hear me? Yes, yes loud and clear. Hello? Yes, yes sir, we, we can, can hear. hear. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So Okay, so uh, welcome to all uh, to this international webinar session. It is a really a very prestigious uh, session so far I found. And uh, there are lots of speech and lots of uh, segment we have concluded or we have included into these sessions. So uh, especially I'd like to show my gratitude to the Professor Ilso Moon and uh, my friends, uh, Munjurul Amin Rani and also Professor, and also Professor Mohammad Uddin Dafil for the very uh, interesting session so far I have heard and I have learned a lot from you all. So uh, actually uh, I'm Dr. Imdi Ashabur Rahman. I'm Asian professor, Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences and as a vice president of Bangladesh Neuroscience Society. So firstly, just for my curiosity, actually uh, yesterday I just searched a uh, Google search actually like you, but I searched a different way. I searched actually what is the post COVID causes neurological disorder. I found that what is the actual information? How many information is there? And interestingly, there are 13 million informations. Though, though I don't know the correct exit situation of Bangladesh, probably after showing my data, it would be very clear to all of you that is what is the current scenario of Bangladesh about the post-COVID neurological disorder. So 13 million informations are uh, searched by the Google. So it's a huge information. 
So firstly, please let me show something about uh, some points. Actually, uh, my previous speaker, Mr. Uh, Dr. Amin, and also uh, Dr. Rahman, he's all said about the coronavirus. Actually, coronavirus, they act by two ways. That is already uh, said. First, they clog on the blood supply to the brain. That might lead to inflammation. Finally, they may lead to a stroke or something like that. Another issue is they may reduce the oxygen level in the brain. Since the oxygen level is declined, so that the brain inflammation will be severely high. And that is a really a very important issues for the coronaviruses, how they affect on the brain. Though they don't cross the blood brain barrier, but uh, since the Professor Duffield, he has already said about some predispositions or to some invitations or some brain dysfunction may lead to the severe damage. Here, uh, after introducing the viruses, they trigger the actual systemic inflammation. That systemic inflammation may lead to neurodegenerations, some of the memory loss, language problem, Alzheimer disease, some other cases. So this is one of the cases. Another point we have already said, that is the COVID, they increase the inflammatory signals and that are responsible for the huge cytokine storm. And that are a very causative factor for producing acute respiratory distress syndrome, multiple organ failure, hyperinflammations, and finally death. So actually uh, COVID is a mystery. If you think that previously people thought that COVID comes might be the new viruses, uh, it would be effect, but gradually, gradually, every day we learn something from the COVID because COVID teaches us a lot. Lots of information are important. Now, the information about the post-COVID neurological complication is a very important issue. We need to focus on it. So it's a global threat to the nervous systems because they act on the systemic CNS, PNS, and post-infections. In the systemic disease, they may lead to stroke or hypoxia and inflammations. Anosmia is a very common disease and multiple organ failure and acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. This is a very common disease for the COVID, though it is rare, but to some extent, the main problems will be hypoxia, stroke, inflammations. This is a most triggering factors from the COVID. So actually, this is the information that comes from the uh, uh, paper, uh, actually news from the writer. They say one in every five persons suffered by the depression, anxiety, and dementia. The study was conducted on the COVID, after COVID, this is post-COVID patients. So it's a daily very important issue. So we have to look on it. And another point is, uh, Another study, they say it, the anosmia, myalgia, and headache. These are also the common important uh, symptoms of the post-COVID patients. So uh, if, you say, if you see another study, that is the Lancet Psychiatry, they say, it, uh, this is a UK-based study, they said in case of the post-COVID patient, the encephalitis and uh, ischemic and neurocognition syndrome, and disorder, the behavioral disorder, this is very common disease of the post-COVID patients. And also um, another study, it, is, it, is, it was conducted on Spain and that study also said, or uh, also showed that myalgia, headache, dizziness, anosmia, is a very common disorder or myopathy is a very common disorder of the post-COVID patients. So from all of this scenery, it is very common that is the post COVID has definitely some impacts on the brain or on some uh, psychiatric issues. So that's why it's a very important issues. We need to focus whatever in Bangladesh because Bangladesh is also within the danger. So what will be the parameter or how, or what are the steps we should take to remove such types of problems? Here, uh, we have conducted a study. So here uh, we found the number of respondent was 2037. And the duration of survey was around six months. It's an online-based survey. We use Facebook, Twitter, North University Facebook page, 
by phone. We also communicate with the plasma banks and uh, get the data, patient information. We call them, we set up, we send them the Google Doc file, and we took the information from them or from their belongings, as well as we took the information from the surroundings. So we took lots of uh, uh, media as much as possible, what we can reach. Here, from the sociodemographic data, we found that gen gender variability is not that much high. The ratio is close to similar. Um, and also the age. In case of the age variances, we found uh, uh, around uh, 20 to 30 age. So, and 46% people are within this range, 20 to 30 age. And also we have the volunteers of 30 to 40 age, 40 to 50 and more than 50. So, and we found the income range is within uh, 30 to 50,000 taka. And also the marital status is uh, uh, married person uh, uh, and also the normal person, the variability is not that much high. So in our uh, questionnaire, we gave them the, how about the uh, infected of the coronavirus? Do they infect it? If they said yes, then they were allowed to go for the further questions or to go for ask, answering the further questions. So maximum uh, the people who said yes, they were allowed actually. And also we use another parameter, how they tested positive. It is RT-PCR test or something. Whenever they said yes, then they were allowed to go for the next section. And maximum COVID patients we found, they were one month to more than two months. So that percentage is around 80% uh, people say they have suffered by uh, COVID more than one or more than two months also. And maximum people, maximum volunteers, they took the um, treatment from house. So this is a very important question and very interesting session because in, our, in Bangladesh, maximum people, they were not, or they were not interested at all to take the support from the hospital. Make some people, they stayed at home, they tried to get the support by phone, by somewhere, by taking lots of medicines, uh, rational or irrational, something like that. So that is um, another endangering point to causes the brain infections also, because many people don't know what are they taking, is it relevant or is it irrelevant? This is one of the issues. And they took the supports, from uh, uh, we we gave them the two options ICU and hospitals. So uh, many people they took the support from the hospitals. So eighty percent among them. So from that cases, uh, uh, maximum post COVID patient they said they are suffered by weakness. Ninety two percent people said they were suffered by weakness, severely weakness. They didn't face uh, ever in their life. And seizure is also uh, not likely that much high, but seizure is also a tendency for them. But they were facing difficulties while talking or giving a speech. 83% people, they were not interested at all to talk with their neighborhood or with their family members. So this is a, uh, another issue because this is a motor skills, uh, sensation nerve is not working properly. So that's why they are facing troubles. And also they say they are facing difficulties during the motor movement. 66% people said, yes, they are facing difficulties. And also they have some vision problems, eye vision problems. So motor nerve is not functioning proper well, properly well. And also they found some other, uh, they are not interested at all to adopt with the new identifiable behavior. They were so irritated they are not interested at all to accustomed with the new environment. So this is one of the problems for them. So, and also we want to learn them, did they suffer or did they suffer any loss of cognition? And 52% say people said, yes, they are suffered by loss of the cognition. Uh, Make some cases that uh, since the questionnaire is uh, difficult for them to give the answer. So their family members were asked to give the answers also. And maximum people, they suffered by mental disorder. So the common mental disorder is anxiety, 
depression and memory disorder. So these are very common uh, for Bangladeshi people, but the people who suffered by the post COVID, they say they have been suffered by anxiety depression. So that's why our next issue, actually, if they suffered by the anxiety and dep depression, is it very common to them or is it new adventure for them? So that's why we go for the next question here. But before that, I have to show you, did they take or took any medication for managing the neurological disorder? 75% people said they took the self medications. So self medication is also a very important and common tendency for the Bangladeshi people for managing any other disorder and also the neurological disorders. So that's why uh, we took the question here, anxiety and depression, is it common to them or is it new? So we gave them the questionnaire anxiety and depression before affecting by the coronavirus. 57% people said yes, and 43% people said no, they didn't have any anxiety and depression. But after affecting by the coronavirus, the 83% people said they have suffered by anxiety and depression. So this is a very important issue. We look into this matter and also Professor uh, Monjurul Amin, he has already said in his paper that was published in the Lancet Psychiatry, that is the uh, post-COVID patient has a common tendency to the anxiety and depression around 40% or around 20 uh, to 30% people. And also, since they have the anxiety and depression, so we gave them uh, the marking, uh, the zero to three range, three to five range, five to seven, seven to 10. Seven to 10 is higher range, and zero to three is the very uh, lower range. We found the severity of the anxiety is very high. The 64% people said they have the severe anxiety. So this is a very important issue for them because the anxiety is very difficult to treat for them. So that's why they said the severity of anxiety. And the severity of depression, 54% people said they have the high depressions. They didn't even suffer such type of depression in their life. And headache, 94% people said they have headache. And it is closely similar with the findings that found from the um, psychiatry, from the uh, Lancet Psychiatry and JAMA. And also the memory loss, 83% people say it. So they, they forget some other issues. They forget, uh, some people say it, they forget their address also. And also they forget how to communicate. They, they, they didn't even behave properly. They didn't even addressing the people properly after affecting by the coronavirus. Most importantly, many people, they say it, they have suffered by the fearness of death. So that's why the nightmare is very common to them. So since the nightmare is very common, so we gave them the two types of questionnaire that is the sleeping hour before infected with the coronavirus. We found 66% people, they have uh, say it, um, uh, more than eight hours sleeping, six to eight hours sleeping. So more or less they are very common uh, mood in the sleeping. But after affecting with the coronavirus, 77% people say they have the sleeping time sharply declined to the four hours or less than four hours. It is most commonly happened because the fairness of death triggered them not to sleep. So that's why their sleeping time is declined. In addition, if we make a link between the sleeping, between the neurological disorder, between the uh, mental disorder, between the memory disorder, sleeping is directly related with them. Since sleeping is uh, strictly or sleeping is directly affected, that might lead to, or that may lead to the neuropsychiatric disorder. So uh, these are my studies. So from the study, I found that make some people they suffered by anxiety, depression, memory loss, and complete loss of cognition. And finally, they have suffered by severe sleeping problem. So thank you very much. Thank you for your nice attention. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to say something or to show my data regarding the post-COVID neurological complication. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you so much, sir. Um, now, <clears throat> I would like to call upon Dr. Furkan Uddin, 
who is the head of clinical research at the Center for Precision Therapeutics, Genetics and Genomic Medicine Center at um, Neurogen Children's Healthcare. I welcome you, sir. Thank you, Tahreen, for inviting me this session. Can you hear me, Mr. Yes, Shah? Sir. Everything finally described by the, all the speakers previously. So just I outlined on the clinical manifestation and what would be management about the post-COVID neurological complication. Near about though primary manifestation of COVID, mainly respiratory, cardiac, but neurological features are also reported in literature as a case report or case series. The most common report symptom include headache and dizziness followed by encephalopathy and delirium. Delirium means restlessness, illusion, incoherence. Among other complications, though we are uh, like- Sorry, say, would, you please, would you please share your screen? We can see No, no, no. I am just summarized the previous um, talk about I'm just uh, synopsis, presenting synopsis only. Among the complication. Okay, thank you. Rear complication, though this is the rear complication, cerebral accident, most common. Uh, Mr. Ronnie also mentioned that GVS, acute transverse myelitis, acute encephalitis also reported, but Total 2,800 article we have found by Google search, the most common presentation post COVID neurological, mainly anosmia. That means loss of, um, loss of sensation of smell and loss of taste and delirium, depression. This is the most common among the people. I have, I have studied through the uh, World Health Organization's latest booklet, COVID-19 associated mental and neurological manifestation, including delirium, agitation, meningoencephalitis, sense of loss of smell and test sensation. This is the most common and already already have been mentioned in the COVID recent booklet, which published um, December 2020. In many cases, neurological manifestation have been reported, even without respiratory symptom. This is the most important. From Wuhan, China, last study, they revealed that anxiety and depression, most common in Spain, Michigan. This is, uh, this study also revealed that anxiety and depression as well as delirium. Though delirium is a neuropsychiatric emergency. So we should emphasize on delirium. Besides this, World Health Organization booklet mentions cerebrovascular disease like stroke, ischemic heart disease are the near about 20% patient already being suffered after COVID manifestation. Six month 
consequences of COVID-19 patient discharge from hospital, a cohort study, large cohort study, near about 1,700 patients with COVID-19. They are assessed six months after discharge. Most patients also exhibited mainly muscle weakness, sleep difficulties, anxiety and depression. So in every aspect, we are seeing that anxiety, depression, delirium are the most common post-COVID complication. Let's talk about delirium. We recommend delirium is a neuropsychiatric emergency. We know. So we have to emphasize to take measures that prevent delirium should be implemented by using the standardized protocol. Manage an underlying cause of delirium by monitoring if a patient present the delirium, we should look into the his or her oxygen saturation, fluid status, and any metabolic or endocrine abnormalities, or addressing any co-infection because all MEG causes the delirium. So this delay is due to COVID. So we should manage the underlying and should give attention underlying cause of delirium. Acute pain due to the physical illness and ear hunger should be associated as trigger so it should need address immediately. The for severe hesitation in case of delirium, we should start the antipsychotic drug, namely mainly haloperidol, with a low dose can be considered. But we have to look into the adverse effect like Q2, QT prolongation by doing SCG, ECG. So here, haloperidol, we can prescribe in case of delirium, starting dose, start from the low, low dose. And gradually you can increase if is it tolerable. Anxiety, Mr. Ashraf already mentioned that anxiety he found in his study, anxiety is the main. So this is the psychological first state. Stress management should be given. For relief anxiety, causing severe distress and that is not responsible to psychosocial support, we can give the patient benzodiazepine, can be considered. Another big problem, complication, psychosis. The so psychosis means, this is an, you know, one kind of distortion of thinking and perception. Inappropriate narrow range of emotions, incoherent talk, hallucination, deletion, disorganized behavior, and may present hesitation. This is dangerous. So psychosis should be treated antipsychotic drug like haloperidol, chlorpromazine, and 
fluofenazine. When you prescribing the haloperidol chlorpromazine fluofenazine, there may be side effect or extra pyramidal side effect, just like Parkinsonism or dystonia. What will do? If extra pyramidal side effect occur, of course, you should reduce the dose of anti called psychotic medication. If not, extra pyramidal side effect withdrawal not occur, then consider switching to another antipsychotic drug, such as like chlorpromazine. Consider anticholinergic medication for short time use. If this strategy fail, extra pyramidal side effect are acute, severe, or disabling, then anticholinergic medication you can give. In case of depression, uh, we use selectively serotonin reuptake inhibitor uh, named flux, flux, uh, fluxetin and tricyclic antidepressant like uh, amitriptyline. These two drugs are most popular in the worldwide and we can use in case of depression, uh, namely. SSRI, that means serotonin reuptake inhibitors and tricyclic, tricyclic antidepressant as well. This is the most too popular drug. Though the primary manifestation is respiratory cardiac, but neurological feature we can found during the COVID infection and post COVID infection also. So we should carefully prescribe the drugs needed for the population. Um, and Sirela, I have mentioned in my lecture. So thank you, Ashraf, for inviting me. This is Thank you, sir. Um, lastly, uh, I would like to call upon Dr. Hassan Mahmoud Reza, sir, uh, who is serving as a professor and acting uh, dean at the Department of School of Health and Life Sciences in Nasser University, and he is also the president of Bangladesh Neuroscience Society. Welcome, sir. Um, thank you, Taharin, for moderating this uh, very important scientific session. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude and thanks to all the speakers, all the overseas speakers especially. And uh, today we had uh, speakers from South Korea and from other countries like Canada, uh, USA, and of course from Bangladesh. Um, as the session chair of this uh, webinar, I would like to summarize the whole things uh, very briefly. Before that, I would like to uh, give you some important uh, message about the Bangladesh Neuro uh, Neuroscience Society. Actually, we established and we launched this society in 2017. Our aim is to encourage the young people of this country to be more involved and to be encouraged in science education, especially in neuroscience. They should learn more about the neuroscience and in later time, they may be involved in neuroscience uh, research. Our second aim was to bring the scientists and um, clinical practitioners who are actually involved in neurological disorders, treatment and uh, basic research. So we are trying to establish a common platform where uh, they can come and uh, share their valuable experiences. In this way, we can develop a good neurological and neuroscience society in Bangladesh. Well, uh, we have been organizing a good number of programs uh, with the young people uh, who are the college students. And uh, today, this is uh, the first international uh, webinar that we have arranged uh, with the help from 
all you are present today. Okay, so we are actually passing a very hard time. COVID-19 pandemic is, is still on and we are uh, in this pandemic. Uh, as uh, Dr. Saidur Rahman said that the situation in Bangladesh is quite better. And uh, at this moment, the infection rate as well as total death is uh, gradually decreasing. So this is a very good news for all of us, but this is not the end. Since vaccines are coming and the rollout has already been taken in different countries, including Bangladesh, we are hoping that uh, uh, in uh, some months, uh, most of the people in Bangladesh will be vaccinated. But during this time, again, we need to follow all the measures that have been advised by WHO as well as Bangladesh government, especially um, in the case of in case of wearing masks and uh, social distance maintaining. Anyway, our first speaker was uh, Professor Moon. He was from the South Korea. He pointed out very nicely about the significance and the importance of meditation that can help actually in the alleviation of mental stress. And um, we, uh, one of the one of the uh, advices uh, to reduce the uh, transmission of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, was the quarantine as well as the uh, isolation. And uh, this thing actually is not liked by most of the people when they are in quarantine, when they are isolated, they cannot mix well with all their near and dears, they cannot uh, move freely. And that makes sometimes uh, a tremendous pressure uh, on their minds. And, and that leads to development of different type of uh, neurological disorders and also that leads to psychiatry. So this thing has been uh, well described by Professor Moon and he has shown the importance of uh, meditation. And uh, basically he has given some good examples that are followed in South Korea and South Korea is one of the most successful countries who has managed that the country has managed very well the transmission of uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, from the very early by taking all these steps very strictly. So uh, I think the meditation is a very uh, good way and uh, we can also uh, take that uh, advice to remain uh, free from anxiety, depression, and all sorts of uh, mental disorders. And then uh, he actually uh, uh, gave the emphasis, basically that we need to uh, uh, feel the external stimuli rather than taking our internal thoughts that much that keeps our brain most of the time very active. And if we can keep our brain uh, away from all these internal thoughts, then I think the mental peace can rise. So actually he has pointed that thing very nicely. Then uh, Dr. Munjurul Rani, uh, nicely he has also showed uh, what are different complications. Uh, basically he has shown two types of complications, acute and chronic and uh, myalgia, headache, loss of taste, loss of smell, all these things are very common. And we have also seen that many COVID-19 patients are coming with this, this type of complications. And you'll be happy to know that in some hospitals in Bangladesh also, uh, they have set up a special corner to provide uh, some suggestions and advices to the patients who are having this kind of complications um, after uh, COVID-19 recovery. So this is also a very important uh, point. And uh, uh, Monjul, uh, Dr. Monjul has also given a very nice uh, information that uh, the people who are obese, who are having uh, COPD, who are having cardiovascular diseases and diabetes, uh, they actually are the uh, most uh, in the risk group of developing, developing this kind of neurological disorders. And um, uh, we need to take care of all these things. Then uh, Dr. Duffield, uh, this is a very nice scientific presentation and he has tried to give some link, uh, linkage between the genet genetics and the COVID-19. Um, the persons who are having some uh, already mutations in some genes involved in the immune system, those people may have uh, some uh, extra problems. And if their immune system is uh, naturally faulty by the mutation of this kind of, in this kind of genes, 
they may respond differently. So for the treatment and for the better uh, life for those kind of people who are having mutations in their immune system or the genes involved in immune system, they uh, are in really uh, danger and they may develop both uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic, whatever the case in case of COVID-19, they will have different type of problems. So uh, special uh, treatment uh, needs to be given, medication uh, should be uh, prescribed for them. And he has also shown that uh, a good number of genes uh, that might remain mutated in some patients. And uh, if those patients are uh, infected by COVID-19, then uh, the severity may go more and more. And the uh, schizophrenic patient and uh, COVID-19, uh, he has also given a very good uh, relation between uh, these two. So uh, this is also very important and we have to take care especially our uh, people who are having uh, schizophrenia and other uh, neurological disorders, they should be keep away and they should be taken well care of so that they are not infected by COVID-19 because the complications are likely to be more in this kind of patients. Uh, Ashraf Rahman, he has uh, given some recent pictures in Bangladesh. The study is ongoing and we have been conducting this study with help of some of the uh, key persons present in today's uh, webinar. And um, our primary results or preliminary results show that uh, uh, there are more than 2000 respondents and um, we have found that uh, in most of the cases, uh, the uh, respondents who are within the age between 20 to 30, uh, around 46% of them have some sort of neurological disorders. And 66% uh, have movement disorders, 64% have uh, anxiety, as well as 54% respondents have shown the depression. The study is not yet complete, so we're trying to wrap up the study and hopefully it will be published this result very soon. And finally, our uh, last speaker was uh, Dr. Furkanuddin. Furkanuddin has actually given uh, some recent uh, uh, findings uh, in a very brief way, and uh, he has, mentioned that uh, uh, more than 2,800 uh, 2, articles have shown that uh, the COVID-19 patients who have recovered, uh, they are having severe problems in uh, spell, in taste, and also uh, they have some uh, problems in the uh, neural disorders. And uh, most of the people are, are who have recovered from COVID-19, uh, they have anxiety, they have depression, and this is not in a particular country, rather the, this picture uh, we have found across the globe. So, and he has also given uh, some medications that can be prescribed uh, when a person are having, when some persons are having a uh, delirium. So uh, today, all the speakers uh, pointed out very nice uh, issues related to COVID-19 and neurological disorder. And uh, I'm sure those who have heard today's webinar, uh, definitely they are going to be benefited. And if they need further information, the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences of North South University will be happy to provide any kind of infor information and assistance to those people. And uh, from the School of Health and Life Sciences, North South University, as the Dean of this school, I would like to express again my gratitude and thanks to all the speakers, uh, you have actually made this webinar successful, I'm sure. And uh, in near future, we'll be arranging this kind of nice uh, webinar that can help people around the world. And that will also help people how to remain good and protected uh, from uh, COVID-19. And finally, I would like to uh, request all the audience that, uh, uh, although we are having good number of effective vaccines, vaccine rollout is on in many countries, but uh, this is not the end because we know that vaccines are not 100% effective. Uh, in some cases, it is 70%, 80%, 90%. Also, there are different type of new variants. We, we are not still sure what vaccine is going to be effective against this kind of new strain. So always we have to be very careful we have to maintain the uh, rules of uh, remaining healthy 
we must wear a mask, we must, we must maintain the social distancing, and of course, we'll uh, clean our hands regularly. With these few words, uh, I would like to uh, thank once again all of the uh, speakers. You have uh, taken your valuable time, uh, and uh, we're really honored, and you have enriched our knowledge to some level. And thank you very much, all the audience who have uh, listened this long time. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank again, Dr. Ashrafur Rahman as the General Secretary of Bangladesh Neuroscience Society to take the initiative. And also Dr. Saidu Rahman as the Chair of the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences to organize this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay fine and stay healthy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for all the information. And I'm sure we'll be just meeting again, I mean, like in some other occasion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, respected faculty and faculties and professors for giving us such an insightful session. Thank you so much. Thank you.